thanks very much for the invitation uh, to come back to my uh, alma mater. I know it's, it's probably about 15 years since I was here. It's changed dramatically, um, uh, and it, it's, it's good to be here. I, I spent um, time as an undergraduate dental student here, uh, and then since everything merged in London, um, I, I was also doing, I did general surgery at Bart's. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you for starting off. Okay. I haven't given you a big, big intro. Anyway. No, I know, that's good, that's good. And um, I, I spent some time at Bart's as doing general surgery where just soon after Ian was appointed, I think, as a consultant, at a time when Bart's had an A&E department, uh, but was metamorphosing into something better, I'm sure. Um, anyway, uh, so it's great to be back, and, and things have changed dramatically. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is uh, give you an introduction into craniofacial surgery. Uh, Ian asked me to talk about, to, to try and inspire you, and I don't know if I'll be able to do that, but there are only five centres in the U UK that carry out transcranial craniofacial surgery, and there aren't very many job opportunities. Um, so I hope you're inspired a bit. But job opportunities are difficult, so you need to think about that. Uh, but for me, I've had fantastic opportunities, and I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing than craniofacial surgery. Uh, hope that feeling comes across to you uh, at the end. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is talk a little bit about what I think craniofacial surgery is. And that might seem like an odd sort of thing to start with. Uh, and it's probably something I don't really understand. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about craniosynostosis, uh, talk about how craniosynostosis presents, some of the problems that it, it presents, uh, and some of the ways that we deal with those problems. So craniofacial surgery encompasses surgery of the face and the cranial cavity and associated brain. So it's really the junction between the face and the brain that's, that, that I deal with. And that's why it's so interesting, because it offers a whole panoply of different types of pathology to deal with, and some of the consequences of dealing with that are very profound. And also some of the results and some of the things that we can do are hugely rewarding. So from a surgical perspective, the surgery is great fun. From a personal perspective, dealing with patients, both adults and children, is fantastically stimulating, and it can be incredibly rewarding. Um, so the, the basis of craniofacial surgery is trauma. And living in Glasgow, as I do, we do see trauma from time to time. Um, this is just one picture of uh, a father who upset his son, who uh, took revenge for this upset with a large kitchen knife. So this kitchen knife entered the orbit and traveled along the skull base to the back of this man's spine, transected his carotid artery on the left-hand side, and indented his vertebral artery on that side as well. So if you think back to some of your anatomy, uh, this has significant consequences. So dealing with this type of problem involved both working with my neurosurgical colleagues and the interventional radiologists to look at the vessel damage uh, and dealing with that was hugely interesting and stimulating from a surgical perspective. Um, other types of thing that we see in trauma, this is what happens if you're in an avalanche, or can happen if you're in an avalanche. Um, this is a 3D reconstruction of a skull, and you can see the head completely smashed, the orbit smashed, the face smashed, and if you look at the, the lateral view of a CT scan, you can see the significant amount of brain injury that's occurred. 
So this presents significant challenges. It presents challenges to put everything back together like a jigsaw puzzle, but it also presents challenges to help the patient and their family rehabilitate after a significant brain injury. And that's another one of the areas which is challenging and interesting in terms of craniofacial surgery. So I regard this as not just a matter of a surgical exercise, but it is looking after the whole patient and their family and helping them to deal with and optimize the outcome from something like this. Likewise, oncology can have a role and this is a scan of a large tumor um, from an orbit from the sinonasal tract and extending intracranially. And again, this presents uh, surgical challenges and manager management challenges for managing the patient. And in the past, and, and when I when I was involved in craniofacial surgery originally, I did quite a lot of skull base oncology. Uh, and it's something that I do less of now. But nonetheless, it presents some fascinating challenges, both surgically and, again, in, in the wider management size, side of things. So it's a, it's a fascinating area that has a huge number of pathologies to deal with. So let's just think about some of the congenital problems that we see and uh, talk a little bit about facial clefting. So this is a, a picture which you'll, you'll be familiar with of the, the develop, developing um, embryo. And as you remember, the maxillary processes... I don't know, Ian, have you got a pointer? Because no one else seems uh, to. Um, no. No. Okay. Uh, I have right. my hand, I'm sorry. Don't worry. I don't, um, just, so you maxillary, can start with the chair if you want. Maxillary processes coming out laterally, coming round laterally, eyes placed uh, on the lateral side and you can see the nasal pit and the front of nasal process coming down the middle here. So what happens is the maxillary processes come around and the nasal pro front of nasal process comes down and the eyes migrate from a lateral position to a more central position. And if there's a failure here, you can get a cleft. So the conventional cleft lip and palate that one sees here is a failure or perhaps a breakdown uh, after a fusion between the maxillary process and the frontonasal process. So the cleft here is slightly off the midline. And here in the bilateral cleft, it's off the midline with the frontonasal process coming down. And um, so that's a, a conventional uh, cleft lip uh, and palate. And then we can come to this situation here with a child where something has gone seriously wrong with this process. And the really, really interesting thing to me is if you look at the close-up of this picture, you can see that the frontonasal process has come down to just about here. And you can see a little Y here as the maxillary processes have come across and fused in the midline. Uh, so that's instead of the breakdown between the frontonasal process and the maxillary process. This is a failure of the frontonasal process coming down and the maxillary processes have met in the midline and you can just about see the line of fusion. Uh, so that perhaps explains some of the, the way that that's happened. And interestingly, you can see for yourself some of the difficulties that this baby has. Most babies are obligate nasal breathers, and so he's got a tracheostomy. Uh, and again, feeding for obligate nasal breathers is a big problem. Uh, and so he's got a, an orogastric feeding tube as well. So just begins to show some of the difficulties and problems that these babies have. This type of abnormality is extremely rare, uh, and it, it, it's really, I've only shown it uh, not so much in 
how we're going to deal with it, but how it ties into the facial development uh, and understanding what's going on. So if there is a failure of fusion and a cleft, there are multiple other sites where that can happen. Uh, and famous craniofacial surgeon Paul Tessier from Paris, he predicted where all these clefts would occur and ascribe numbers to them, 1 to 30, both for the soft tissues and for the bones. And you can look that up, um, but it demonstrates where all the clefts are. But here you can see a defect in the anterior skull base here at the front. And you can see the nose on the, on the, on the right-hand side here is clear, as the dark area is air. But on the left-hand side is herniated brain tissue or glial tissue that's come down in through the cleft into the nose, uh, and that's a frontal encephalocele uh, as a result. And if, if this patient uh, tries to pick his nose, he'll actually be touching dura uh, and touching his brain. So this is a sort of cleft in the midline, and one of the things that can occur, but not in this particular case, is if that cleft is wider, the eyes don't migrate as far from the lateral position to the medial position, so they end up with hypertelorism. I think you're going to see some pictures of hypertelorism a bit later on uh, in, in Margot's presentation. So here you can see a different form of clefting. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about craniosynostosis, and this is a picture of a family uh, with Cruzon syndrome, uh, and I think you're going to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, but you can see that the mother has Cruzon syndrome, has had, been operated on, uh, as have the three children. Uh, and um, they're all actually doing fine at the moment. Um, anyway, so craniosynostosis is the premature fusion of the skull sutures. And Skull development and facial development involves a number of different stages uh, and one of them is the formation of bones and then the formation of sutures which allow for skull development and skull growth. If the sutures for some reason fuse early, you end up with restriction of growth in relation to that suture at uh, 90 degrees to that. So here you can see fusion of the metopic suture leading to a uh, trigonocephalic shaped head or shaped a bit like a, 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 a pointy, pointy head here. And this in itself is not of major medical concern. About 10% of these patients have raised intracranial pressure and there is perhaps some evidence that they have um, reduced IQ and there is some association with some speech delay, but overall it is not of it in of itself a major problem. Uh, but if one has a major uh, abnormality of the skull in this way and one's growing up in school and so on, it is something that will make you the object of undue attention and that in itself may have developmental uh, and uh, significant consequences in terms of psychological development. So for these sorts of patients we do offer surgery um, and as you can see it's, it's, it would be quite a significant abnormality uh, in uh, later childhood uncorrected. This is an example of a unicoronal synostosis, so the coronal suture is fused prematurely. It, ends, it, it results in a facial asymmetry with flattening of the forehead on the affected side, bossing on the unaffected side. Uh, and we can investigate this in, in, in a number of ways, and in those cases where there's some doubt in the diagnosis, we can do a CT scan do a 3D reconstruction and here you can see on the left hand side the coronal suture is perfect 
and on the right hand side is completely absent. The orbits are shaped asymmetrically and pulled up and uh, in previous times that was called a harlequin eye sign uh, because it looked a bit like a harlequin on a plain x-ray. Uh, we tend not to do plain x-rays anymore and just use CTs when we need them. But, but that's the abnormal head shape and the missing suture. And you can see it's ridged where the um, suture was originally and it's fused prematurely. That was the case of a unilateral coronal synostosis and this is a bilateral coronal synostosis. And here you can see the effect there is that the, the, the skull is pinched uh, at, at right angles to the affected suture and one gets a tall, broad skull, uh, flattened skull. Um, and very occasionally, the landoid suture can be affected. Usually this isn't of major consequence uh, and normally we wouldn't image these children because uh, uh, an abnormality in the shape of the back of the head is, is really not a major problem in terms of social integration and, and so on. However, in this particular case, he had uh, one of the very few cases with raised intracranial pressure, uh, and that's why he was imaged. Uh, but as you can see again, he's got a missing uh, coronal suture on, on, on the right hand side there. If more than one suture is involved, one can get quite odd shaped heads. Uh, and this is uh, Leone who's got, who's got um, multiple suture involvement. Uh, and the skull continues to grow, uh, but it's, it's constrained by the sutures involved. And as the brain continues to grow, it, it takes quite a, a curious shape. Um, this is her CT. And one of the things that you can see, this is a 3D reconstruction, is that there are defects in the skull, and those are real. And that's because the constraining features of the skull uh, have, have caused the pressure to build up within her head. So she's getting raised into cranial pressure, which subsequently leads to erosions on the inner surface of the skull. And then eventually they work their way through. Um, to give this uh, what used to be called copper beaten appearance because on plain films that's what it looks like and certainly in reality you can see it it's a scalloped appearance on the inside of the skull so that's what's happening here and that's because all the sutures are, are fused early the brain continues to grow and um, it causes an increase in pressure so this is her, her um, CT scan just in a normal axial uh, view and you can see the skull defects with a little bit of bulging here of the, the dura bulging through here and this scalloped appearance uh, as the skull is, is eroded by the raised pressure. Um, so what we would, I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do for her later. but. That's not the only reason why one can get raised into cranial pressure. Uh, and this is a, a CT scan of a similar looking patient. But you can see here the, the, the scan, these are huge ventricles. Uh, and she's got raised intracranial pressure as a result of hydrocephalus. So in this particular case, uh, she underwent uh, the placement of a shunt to relieve this raised intracranial pressure. Uh, and here you can see that that's, that's the shunt in, in the ventricles and you can see how they've collapsed down. In fact, she's slightly over shunted. You can see uh, the defect at the top, it's, it's scalloped in um, and, and that's been corrected now. Um, but she was slightly over shunted when we did that scan um, to relieve the pressure. However, in the previous case, what we did was a skull vault expansion because the problem was not of hydrocephalus but of constrained growth. Um, so what, do we, what are the problems associated with these children? Well, they can be multiple. 
Um, you can see here at tracheostomy, so airway problems, particularly in early in life when they're very small, they have retrusive maxillae, uh, the, the top jaw is retrusive. Um, because the forehead is retruded and the maxilla is retruded, the eyes can be exposed and one can have, these children can have ophthalmic problems with exposed corneas, uh, feeding problems as you can see, and, and this baby's got a tracheostomy, and associated other problems, and you can see he's, he's kept in a slightly curious position because he's got fixed flexion deformities of his limbs, and that's why he's lying on the operating table in that slightly curious way. So they can have airway problems, breathing problems, and some of the airway problems, the breathing problems are secondary to raised pressure, or some of them have central apneic problems. Uh, so they have some central problems, central resistance to breathing. Uh, raised intracranial pressure, which we've touched upon. Uh, they can have feeding problems for obvious reasons. Uh, ophthalmic problems because of exposure of the eyes, but also raised intracranial pressure can lead to um, you know, papilledema uh, and loss of vision or damage to vision in that way uh, and they often have associated abnormalities. In terms of development, I don't know why it suddenly got light but uh, um, I don't know if you, you, you can still see that. So. Um, in terms of development uh, and IQ there is some evidence that operating on these children, even single sutures, offers some improvement in the outcome in terms of IQ, but it is relatively soft evidence. So how do we manage these patients? Well, it's obvious that the management is multidisciplinary, requires lots of different specialists, and it's one of the things that I find so interesting is that we deal with these patients as part of a team and the actual craniofacial <coughs> surgery for them is a relatively small part uh, and you'll probably hear about that later but really the operation at the time is a major intervention uh, but over the lifetime of the child it's a small part and the objective obviously is to maximize uh, potential developmentally and aesthetically and deal with all the functional problems. So the, the key procedure for this is a frontoorbital advancement or sort of Humpty Dumpty operation where we take the skull to bits and put it back together again in a, in a better shape but also creating more space for the brain to grow into. So here you can see uh, a child with a metopic synostosis uh, and you can see that's the frontal bone and you can see it's very, very pointy. We dismantle it. Uh, and these are just examples, not the same case, but we can dismantle the frontal bones uh, and then reassemble them, put them back together in a new shape, and we fix these with uh, absorbable screws and plates. Uh, and it, this is, to a certain extent, a sort of carpentry exercise, uh, but it is, it, it is the very satisfying to do if you like doing surgery and doing things with your hands but in terms of overall looking after the patients it's, it's only a small part of what happens. Many of these patients have significant facial abnormalities or facial problems uh, and in adolescence we often operate, often offer surgery to try and address this. So this is a, a patient uh, who I think you're going to see a picture of when she was very small um, and you can see she has significant mid-face retrusion and what we've done for her is a mid-face advancement uh, subcranially so she had child forehead surgery in infancy and you can see the change in her appearance just with a single operation and bone grafting uh, and you can imagine the difference that that will make to her social interactions uh, and general sense of well-being. Um, that was done through a Lafour 3 osteotomy with a Lafour 1 osteotomy where we detach the mid-face 
uh, at the level of the dotted line uh, and simultaneously uh, at the level of the uh, uh, fixed line at the four one level. Um, so that was a single operation to achieve that. Um, there are other ways, and this is a patient with Cruzon, <coughs> Laura has Cruzon syndrome uh, with significant mid-face retrusion. Uh, and what we did for her was the same procedure, but we used a technique called distraction. Uh, and this is a, an old picture, and I've got two of these picture patients that we did this. Uh, this was done some years ago, and we built this device ourselves with bits and pieces from B&Q which I guess wouldn't be allowed anymore, but uh, that's what we did at the time. Um, and we advanced her mid-face gradually, a bit in the same, same way as uh, limb lengthening is done uh, by the orthopedic surgeons, a technique called distraction. Um, and so we, we did this, and you can see it's a pretty miserable experience, really. They, patients don't particularly like it. Uh, it's, it's not hugely painful, but it's, it's pretty miserable, as you can see. Um, uh, but then we end up looking like that at the end, and it, it does seem worthwhile. Uh, certainly she seems to think it is, uh, and it seems to work. Um, and again, this is a patient with Apert syndrome, and it, we did much the same sort of thing. We did a four three uh, distraction, again with our homemade devices. We now do use commercially available devices. Uh, it, it's just at the time there wasn't really anything uh, available, so we built our own. Uh, and we can end up with an appearance like that and cure his acne at the same time. Um, so hopefully make a, a big improvement. And certainly this type of surgery, these types of patients, the people that I've looked after uh, from infancy to adulthood, and that's hugely rewarding. And I, you know, this is the sort of thing that 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 makes it all worthwhile. This is a picture of a 20-year-old who I looked after uh, as a as a registrar when I started, and now and then as a consultant. Um, and I've seen him grow up. I've had the privilege to see him and help him through some of these problems, but more so helping his family. Uh, deal with the issues um, in terms of surgery. The surgery I did for him was, I think, not all that major for me, and for, but for him. But in terms of what I've been able to do for the family, hopefully I've helped them get through and maximise their potential. So that's why I find craniofacial surgery interesting and fun. So um, in summary, uh, I can read this as well as you, but I think there are a huge number of complex problems in craniofacial surgery. Um, it's a great privilege to be able to try and try and help people with this, these types of problems. And it's it's a matter of both doing operations, but helping the families, their parents, the patients deal with the issues. And it's very difficult when a when you're seeing a parent who's had a child who is obviously having some difficulties, when you're seeing them for the first time and trying to explain that you'll know them for the next 20 years and develop a relationship with them, it's a huge privilege. It's, it's really, really very, very interesting. And so for me, it offers interesting surgery interesting challenges intellectually, interesting choices intellectually from a surgical perspective. These are rare cases. We have very few protocols. It's not like common problems which are protocol driven. These are rare problems. And the surgery itself is only a small part. It's supporting the family with the multidisciplinary team and, and working with people like Margot and others is also part of the satisfaction and enjoyment. Um, so management is multidisciplinary and supporting the families is a major component. So thank you very much for your attention.
Dongu, would you like to introduce Margu, as you know Margu far better than me, um, and as I'm uh, a rather late arrival, um, just a quick thing, are you happy to have any of these uh, people come and spend time in Glasgow with you? In, uh, Absolutely, yeah. we're happy to have visitors in our craniofacial clinic, yeah. okay. um, right. whenever you want. Glasgow's very beautiful. It, the, yeah, the weather's crap, but it is <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. How do you want to do this, Ian? Oh, well, no. uh, if, uh, if we have talks and then have questions at the end, I think. Okay, no problem. Um, one of the things that I've enjoyed about being a craniofacial surgeon is having the opportunity to work with uh, a wide variety of people, and Margot is... Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with in our craniofacial clinic. We established a sort of more formal multidisciplinary clinic well, probably some time ago um, when we were at Canisburn Hospital, and it's absolute pleasure. Margot is a remarkable woman um, for lots of reasons, uh, but she's here to talk to you about genetics. Uh, Thank you very great. much. Uh, we're going to get some pictures. <laughs> As uh, David says, I'm a, a clinical geneticist, and in fact, uh, we first worked together when we were senior registrars and have uh, both taken over the consultant post for our, our teams now. Um, clinical genetics, uh, most people think about genetic counselling, and that is a big part of our role. Can you hear me, Simon? You have already seen from some of David's pictures that you know babies that are born with uh, facial deformities, it, it can be quite traumatic to the parents when they, they first see their, their children. And there are lots of people involved in the, the support network, but geneticists often take on the role of kind of coordinating all the different specialties that these children go through throughout their years. And the, the unusual thing about genetics is... <laughs> Um, we, we see um, children, obviously like David, throughout uh, childhood into adulthood and I've now been in genetics long enough that the children that I saw as babies are coming back planning their own pregnancies and having the next generation, um, so that's very satisfying from that point of view. I was a paediatrician before I became a, a geneticist, uh, but more and more the, the doctors that are becoming geneticists are actually adult trained as we find more and more genetic implications for adult onset diseases. So I would say that the majority of geneticists have now got an adult medicine background rather than paediatrics. But because of my kind of paediatric background, um, the things that I've subspecialised in are craniofacial uh, deformities and another aspect of my job is a thing called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where we use IVF technology in order to be able to test embryos for genetic disorders and put back only embryos that are not affected by the genetic diseases. But that's a whole other talk. Today I'm going to speak about my uh, input to the, the craniofacial clinic uh, in Glasgow. Uh, David's already said that you know the, the majority of things that go wrong that lead to these uh, um, facial deformities is either things not coming together at the right time or things coming together and fusing too early. So, as I say, you've already seen these sort of pictures from David. This is another one from the inside of the mouth, just showing the way that the palate comes together. And what you'll have seen from these slides is that it all happens very early in, in pregnancy, all at a very early stage. So, if I start with just kind of straightforward things like uh, orofacial clefting, um, there are lots of different causes of orofacial clefting, and part of the geneticist's role is to try and work out what particular type of cleft a particular patient has. Uh, and I'll kind of show you some examples of these as we, we go through, and also the way that we would assess patients when they're referred to us as geneticists. So even if we go for non-syndromic, the kind of typical uh, cleft, you can see there's a difference between cleft lip with or without a cleft palate and isolated cleft palate. These are two different disorders. Uh, as you can see, the, the frequency of them is different, whether it affects males more than females is different between the two groups. Uh, the chance of that happening again in a future pregnancy is, is much the same. And these empiric recurrence risks are worked out by population studies that if we take 100 couples who have all had a baby with a cleft 
and we look to see how many of them go on and have a second child, we find that two or three of the couples would have a, a second affected child. So that's the way that uh, empiric recurrence are worked out. And non-syndromic clefts are typical of multifactorial inheritance in that they're not directly passed down from generation to generation or just occurring in one generation of a family. But we, we know that genetic factors are involved because once a couple have had a child with a, a cleft, their chance of having a second child is increased. As you can see, the population chance for cleft flip in palate is 1 in 700, but once you've already had an affected child, it jumps up to between uh, 1 in 30 to 1 in 50, so there is a, a big difference. In say multifactorial, with no genetic factors and some other known genetic factors involved. And some children will inherit the genetic factors that make them susceptible to a cleft occurring during pregnancy, and some babies will be exposed to the non-genetic factors, but it's only the group in the middle that will actually develop a cleft. If we uh, look at children who have got clefts, we find that you know about a third to 40% of them will have other medical problems. And of that group that have other medical problems, 50% of them will have a specific genetic syndrome. And we say that's why there is a genetics involved in the, the craniofacial teams to try and pick out these children that have got something other than just a straightforward cleft. So here we have five babies that have all got clefts, and if I work my way through them, you'll see why it's important to get the, the specific diagnosis right. So this first one up here is the typical non-syndromic cleft lip and palate, and the chance of these parents having another child, as I say, is about 2 to 3 percent. The one in the middle, those of you that are sitting near the front might be able to see it's clear in this photograph, a different child with the same condition. This is trisomy 13, or Patau syndrome, where the baby's got an extra copy of chromosome 13. And the additional problems they might have are an exomplence, where the, the vowel has um, come out through the abdominal wall, uh, extra fingers and toes, you can see that the baby's got extra fifth fingers there. Now the chance of these parents having another baby with a chromosome abnormality, not necessarily trisomy 13 again, would be 1%. Again, the child up here, different type of cleft, this is a, a lateral cleft, it's a bit unusual, and this is the type of cleft that we might see with what we call amniotic band disruption. This is something we don't really know exactly what happens during pregnancy, that the amnion breaks and then wraps itself around various different bits of the baby. And the other kind of clues to this might be the cause of this particular cleft is we see these bands around the limbs where the amnion has wrapped around that as well. Now if we see the baby with this cleft, the chance of it happening again in a future pregnancy, we can be quite reassuring to the parents that it's no greater than the, the population chance. This baby down here in the, the bottom left, again, those of you sitting there, the, the front will be able to see that in addition to the bilateral cleft lip, this baby's got what we call lip pits in the lower lip. These are quite obvious ones, sometimes they're much more subtle than this, and it's important when we're examining children that we look for clues like this. This is a dominantly inherited condition, so we'd have to look closely at the parents to see if them, one of them maybe had the lip pits as well. Um, because if they did, the chance of them having a second affected child would be 50%. It's a 50-50 chance each pregnancy for a dominantly inherited condition like Van der Waals syndrome. Now, Van der Waals syndrome is a bit of a kind of exception to the rule in that in this these families you could have isolated cleft lip, you could have cleft lip and palate, but you could also have isolated cleft palate in these families, and that's different from all other types of. Uh, cleft lip and palate syndromes. And sometimes lip pits are the only sign that somebody's affected. It's also what we call not fully penetrant, that some people will have the gene that causes this condition but have absolutely no features of it at all. And the way that we would work out if a parent had the, the gene would be if they went on and had a second affected child even though they were showing no signs of it. And then if we go down to the, the child in the bottom right hand corner, um, this is a baby with a, a cleft palate and you can maybe see again those of you at the, the front that uh, the, there's a <coughs> cephalus seal, uh, a protrusion of the meninges and brain down through the cleft palate. Baby's also got corneal clouding, he's got a problem with his eyes and he's got short limbs. And this is a thing called Peter's Plus Syndrome 
and it's a recessively inherited condition where the baby has inherited a, a faulty copy of the gene from both parents and in that situation there would be a 1 in 4 or 25% chance of them having another affected child. So that's why it's important that we scrutinise the children to try and get a specific diagnosis. Here we, we see a child with a, again a different type of cleft, a midline cleft, and these tend to be sporadic and again we would be able to reassure these parents that the chance of it happening again is no greater than the general population. So like all other specialties in medicine, we kind of work our way through getting a history, particularly a family history in a genetics clinic. We examine our children, we sometimes resort to using computerised databases to try and make a, a, a diagnosis or presenting our patients at regular meetings. And in fact, I was going to be down in London uh, for tomorrow anyway, because we have one of these dysmorphology meetings that we have at Great Ormond Street Hospital four times a year, where we take our patients that have got unusual medical problems that we have not been able to make a diagnosis for in the hope that someone else around the country has seen a, a child with similar problems and we can then get together and try and work out a diagnosis. Sometimes we uh, perform additional investigations and then we follow our patients up because some genetic disorders become more obvious as a child gets older. So what sort of things would be important in the history? Well these children I think you'll agree they've all got a similar appearance in the way that brothers and sisters look like each other and the clue to the diagnosis in this situation is that the, the mums have got epilepsy and they've been taking a medication called sodium valproate um, and it leads to a condition called fetal valproate syndrome which is associated with clefting, it can result in cleft lip or cleft palate and they've also got additional problems quite often learning disabilities. So that's fetal anticonvulsant syndrome. Here we see another uh, child who's uh, had a cleft palate. He's small uh, and he's particularly got a small head circumference for his overall size. And the thing that usually gives the diagnosis away in this situation is that they're hyperactive and they buzz around the clinic room and wrecking the place usually. And the clue in the history, although it's not often volunteered, is that the mum has been a heavy drinker during uh, pregnancy. And this is typical fetal alcohol syndrome. The other things that we look for is that they tend to have a long, smooth philtrum. It doesn't have the usual ridges on the philtrum, and they've got a thin upper lip. Here we see a, a, another child who's got um, a cleft palate with a, a small jaw, and you can see the, the small femurs, the upper parts of the legs, are much shorter than usual, and they're, they're bent, and this is just called femoral hypoplasia unusual Casey syndrome. And we see this uh, condition occurring more commonly in mothers that are insulin-dependent diabetics. So again, there might be the clue in the, the history when we, we speak to the mothers. So family histories are important in genetics, and here we see what we usually draw a typical three-generation family tree. And the, the, the male squares and the female circles, <coughs> and the, the shading green ones in this family have got detached right enough the pink ones are, are short-sighted, uh, the yellow ones have got hearing problems and the one down the bottom right is the one that uh, led us to look at the family in the first instance who had a cleft palate. And when we see kind of all these different medical problems, um, we can put them together and it seems most likely that this baby would have a condition called Stickler syndrome. So here we see the, the baby with the, the cleft palate and again she's got a small jaw and she's got respiratory problems and that's the triad that leads to diagnosis of pure Ravan sequence it's called and pure Ravan sequence quite often uh, occurs in people who've got stickler syndrome the other features of the condition are a and a flat nose and here's another boy with the condition a bit older he's seen for six classes because of the high myopia that they have um, he's wearing his hearing aids he's got his general hypoplasia in adulthood, they get early onset arthritis, which can generally clue to the diagnosis in the family history. And here we see a, a whole family, the baby, the mother, and the grandmother have all got stickler syndrome, but the great-grandmother is unaffected. I think you can see the difference in the facial appearance of the hereditary great-grandmother. This is a dominantly inherited condition again, so there's a 50-50 chance that being passed on each time they, they have a child. And here we see another generation family, the, the baby, cleft um, palate, has learned the band sequence and is quite concerned about the pathology as well. And her mother and grandmother may be affected by stickler syndrome too. 
Well, looking at the model with a gun model, I, I'm not sure that I would have guessed it, but it will have sexual responses. But we have, in fact, seen the mother of the baby when she was a child, and at that time she did have the, the typical uh, sexual response of a female. So as well as the genetic uh, diagnosis becoming more obvious as some children get older, it can sometimes get less obvious, and we often ask people to bring in photographs of them when they were younger in the hope that they might be able to make a diagnosis. So really as a clinical examination, what are we looking for? Well, these are what in genetics terms we call soft signs. They're just little things that give us a clue that there might be something more going on. So top left is uh, a baby with hypospadias. If we saw that in addition to having a cleft lip palate, we might think about fetal valproate syndrome again. Single palmar crease, I mean about 10% of the population have got a single palmar crease, but it occurs more commonly in uh, children with chromosome disorders and some other genetic syndromes. The, the bottom left hand corner is a picture of what we call fetal pads, which are pointy bits in the pulp of the, the fingertips. And again, a certain percentage of the general population have it, but it's another clue that something might be going on. Hypoplastic nails, we see um, when uh, teratogens have maybe been at play, uh, illicit drugs or alcohol can hy cause hypoplastic nails, and again, chromosome abnormalities. And unusual years lead us to, to think that there might be a, a syndrome diagnosis to be made as well. Here we see a, a girl with a, a bifid uvula, which is not unusual in cleft palate clinics because often if you've got a bed with the jupula, you've got um, uh, uh, either pilopharyngeal incompetence or you, you've got a, a cleft of the palate that's not completely through the, 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 the bit of the palate that you can see. <laughs> But this is the same girl that's got the bifid uvula, and what you can see about her is she's got a ratnodactyly, she's got very long fingers and toes, and she's tall and skinny for, for her age, and these are kind of marfanoid appearance. Marfan syndrome is a collagen disorder, and we now know that children with bifid uvulas and a marfanoid appearance and mild learning discipline yeah, are more likely to have a thing called Lewis Dietz syndrome, which is another dominantly inherited condition. And here we see a, a boy who, again, got cleft palate, he's got hypertelorism. This is what David was talking about earlier, he, his eyes are further apart than we would have expected. And he's got unusual toes, he's got what we call two crease and dactyly, and that the, there's a bit of webbing between his second and third toes. But he's also got um, spatulate tips to his toes, and we sometimes refer to these as tree frog appearance of the, the feet. And this is typical of a condition called otopalatal digital syndrome. And this condition is due to a gene which is on the X chromosome, so it tends to affect boys, and the female carriers of the gene tend to have minimal signs of it. So that's this little boy's mother. And the only feature that she's got is that she's got a degree of hypertelorism, or her eyes are a bit further apart than would be expected. Now, sometimes we can get things wrong by looking for these clues. These are two brothers, uh, both got cleft palate, both got hearing problems, and one's also got an additional heart defect. But you can possibly see in the feet that these got tree frog feet again, and we thought this was otopalatal digital syndrome. The mum was pregnant again, and it was a, a female fetus, so we were quite reassuring. Um, that's the close-up of the hands and feet of the boys. But this is the little girl, and as you can see, she's got the tree frog feet as well, and she's got a cleft palate, and she was just as severely affected as the boys. Now, this obviously wasn't otopalatal digital syndrome, and we've been able to prove that by showing that both boys uh, inherited the opposite X chromosome from their mother. One got one of her X chromosomes, and the other one got the other one. So it's not otopalatal digital syndrome. But this is a, a, a consanguineous uh, Pakistani family, the, the mum and dad are first cousins, so that should have kind of made us think that it was a recessive condition and was going to be a, a one in four chance of it happening uh, again, whether it was a male or a female child. Now, hard handles are things that occur in syndromes that are features of very few conditions, and therefore it kind of really narrows down your list of differential diagnoses. Here you can see what we call mitten hands and feet, and in actual fact, that is the hands and feet of the patient that David showed you that had Apert syndrome that had her surgery uh, as a, an adolescent. And the lip pits that I showed you previously in Van der Waals syndrome occur in very few conditions, so that's most likely to be Van der Waals syndrome when you see it. 
This is the girl um, that David showed you when she was older with Apert syndrome as one of the previous synostosis conditions that uh, she received her surgery for. And here is another hard handle, although in this girl we've not been able to make a diagnosis. She's got, a, she had a, a cleft palate, but she's also got a bifid nose and she's got microphthalmia, her left eye is much smaller than the right. She's got quite moderate learning difficulties and as you can see from the photograph of her arm, she's got what we call bilateral radial aplasia, but she's missing the, the radius bones of both her, her forearms. And when you see something as symmetrical as that, it makes you suspect that a gene is involved. But as I say, we haven't yet got a diagnosis for this one. Now, gestalt, it's a, a German word that means that the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And the, the example that I always try to use to uh, describe a gestalt is, I'm sure if I asked anybody out in the street what was the diagnosis from this child, they would all say Down syndrome. But if you ask a medical student, why do you think the baby's got Down syndrome? They say because he's got upslanting palpable fissures, he's got an open mouth appears with a protruding tongue, all these individual things. That a gestalt is just something that you recognise from looking at it. And as geneticists, we're looking at children with syndromes of all time, so we get to know these different gestalt appearances. And I'll just run through a few of them. This is a, a girl with cardiofacial syndrome and again we see quite a lot of these children in the, the cleft and craniofacial clinics because they've got phenopharyngeal incompetence and these are all the different features which you could go through but it really is just a case of recognising that that's what people with phenocardiofacial syndrome look like and we see a lateral view and here's a lot of children with the same condition and it's possibly more obvious when you see them in the flesh than from photographs they're often quite glum looking children because the, the muscles of the, the face don't work as well as they should, uh, they're, they're quite glum, it's called myopathic faces. And this is one where the, the, the appearance changes as they, they get older and they become coarser. This is a, a mother who's affected and a, a gentleman's affected, the baby's not affected but the baby. This is another gestalt that we recognise, this is Cornelia de Lange syndrome. Again, both these babies have got cleft palates, they've also they're very small, they've got very small heads, they've got limb abnormalities, and quite often these children don't survive beyond infancy. And you can single homer crease again, and a degree of tooth crease and tactile in these children. There's another one that associated with cleft palates. This used to be called Kabuki makeup syndrome, and it was called that because it was felt that the features were similar to the kabuki makeup uh, worn by the, the Japanese opera singers, that they, the name didn't go down well with parents, and that's quite often the, the case with genetic conditions, uh, so it's been changed to kabuki syndrome. The boy in the top left is the same child that you've just seen uh, when he's older, and you can see more in that uh, picture what we mean about the kabuki makeup appearance. And it's a, one of these ones that changes as they get older. Yeah. Craniofrontal natal dysplasia, another gestalt. This is an unusual excellent condition because it's more severe in females than it is in males. And we haven't quite worked out why this is the case. These uh, girls quite often have craniosynostosis requiring surgery in addition to, to clefts. Trichard Collins syndrome, particularly associated with uh, maxillary hypoplasia and mandibular hypoplasia. They've often got um, ear abnormalities. The wee boy in the top left hand's got very little ear tissue at all. But if you look at the gentleman in the bottom right, he's got almost normal ears, so the phenotype's quite uh, variable in severity. And heavy facial microsomia. This is a sporadic condition. Again, we don't really know what causes it, but it's thought it might be due to a vascular disruption just at that early stage of pregnancy when the uh, the branchial arches are, are formed. And uh, these are not the same child in different photographs, but this is again a gestalt that you can recognise. And this is a, a recessive condition associated with the palate. Again, profoundly handicapped and often do not survive in the infancy. So we, we use computerised databases. The one that we use was um, developed at Great Ormond Street Hospital and basically you put in the features that the child has, like short palpable fissures, cleft palate, heart defect, 
and then you press a button and then it hopefully comes up with only two syndromes could possibly have these things and these are real cardiofacial syndrome into George syndrome which we now know we're actually in the, the same condition. <coughs> but unfortunately sometimes when you, you put your uh, features in it comes up with 1096 syndrome to you. So you're not any further forward. So we then go on to, to do investigations and the type of investigations that we do are um, here we see two different children with cleft palates and the other thing you might notice about them is that they've got short limbs so the best way to make a diagnosis in that situation is to, to carry out x-rays. This is a, a baby who's now uh, an adult and the unusual thing about him was that he had these protruding lumps lower down in his spine and we were unable to make a, a diagnosis. He had multiple other medical problems. Um, this was him when he got a bit older and one of our registrars who had uh, known him went to work in Cambridge and she came across this other child who reminded her very much of this little boy when he was a, a baby and the little girl had been diagnosed as having lateral meningocele syndrome. So we shot Cameron through a, an MRI or CT scan it was at that time and sure enough he had lateral meningoceles as well. So Sometimes we make the diagnosis just by coming across another patient with the same condition. And that's him when he was older. And as you can see, his father had a very similar appearance. And he had had what he thought was neurofibromas removed from his cervical spinal cord um, as an adolescent. But it seems most likely that they were actually lateral meningoceles that he had too. Obviously, as geneticists, we do chromosome tests, although this is getting updated all the time. This is particularly important for confirming diagnosis of things like trisomy 13. But nowadays, we usually use DNA technology rather than doing chromosome tests, and this is what we call QF-PCR, and what we would expect to see would be two signals, one from each of chromosomes uh, 13, or in this case 21, this is diagnosed uh, Down syndrome by three different signals coming from the three different copies of the chromosome 21 using DNA markers. The next kind of technology that was developed was fluorescent in situ hybridization or fish studies. And these are fluorescent markers that are used to attach on to particular regions of DNA and show up either whole chromosomes or regions of chromosomes. And this is the way that we used to diagnose fetal cardiofacial syndrome because these children were missing a portion of uh, one of the copies of chromosome 22. But nowadays we do that using DNA testing as well, looking at markers along the region of chromosome 22 involved. And moving on again, this is a boy with a bilateral cleft lip and palate and learning disability. And when we checked his chromosomes, they were initially normal. But in recent years, there's been a new technology developed called comparative remote hybridization. And what we do with this situation is we train a control test of him based on bed and the patient in the home, and then we compare them. So the chromosomes from the boy show up that he's got a Y chromosome that the female control didn't have, and that the female control's got a very X chromosome that he didn't have. But what we also notice is that the deletion of chromosome 1 showing up in red as well. And that means that the patient is deleted for that region of chromosome 1 and therefore he's not got the bit that the controls got. So we say we were able to make a diagnosis that we hadn't been with conventional chromosome technology. And Array CGH um, is using that to look at lots and lots of different chromosomes at the same time and the, the regions of chromosomes that we're able to look at now are getting smaller and smaller. So instead of doing a chromosome test in the majority of cases, we now go straight to doing a race CGH. And it's very quickly we get results within about 24 hours. If we're looking at uh, a condition where we know that it's a dominantly or recessively inherited condition, and we know the specific gene involved, then we can do mutation analysis looking for the abnormality in the sequence of the DNA within that gene. And this is what's used to diagnose the children that I've shown you so far that have got all these recognised conditions. So what we're left for is these children that have got unrecognised conditions. And the new kid on the block is this thing called exome sequencing. Now you're probably aware that the, the exons are the regions of DNA that code for our, our genes and there are introns which are redundant DNA and DNA that's used in 
um, DNA processing and the interpretation of it. But only 1% of our uh, whole genome is used for coding for our genes. And so obviously it's much easier to look for changes in just that 1% than it is to do whole genome sequencing. And this is very uh, quick, again, rapid computerized technology, and we're hopefully going to discover much more of the uh, genes that lead to these as yet undiagnosed conditions. Sorry, have I got into one too long? Thank you very much, Margaret. We'll save that to, to later. So we're on to Jill Atfield. Uh, and Jill, I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Uh, and uh, say what you want to say. Um, I um, was widowed in 1973 with three children and I subsequently married again in 1978 to a man called Howard. Um, we had our first son born in December uh, 1979. He was the most idyllic baby imaginable. He slept through the night from the day he was born. He was the image of his father, this is Matthew on the right, um, and you can see the similarity between Howard and Matthew. Um, Howard was the image of his mother. And when you have children that look very like a parent, you tend to assume that they just look like their parent, not that they're both suffering or have a same medical condition. Um, Richard was born just 15 months after Matthew, um, and I have five children. If Matt Richard had been my first instead of my fifth, I would have one because he was an absolute nightmare. Uh, he never slept through the night until he was four years old. He had huge medical problems from the time he was born. He, um, he was a very sickly child. He had lumps in his neck, which they operated on when he was uh, 11 months old and within three weeks they were back again um, and he was eventually referred to an ENT consultant um, who said that he just had l small eustachian tubes, he had uh, that he needed to have grommets fitted, adenoids and he would be fine. Um, but he continued to have lots of medical problems as a youngster and was eventually referred to another ENT consultant in Guildford, which is near where I live, and saw him for several years. And he was then referred to a hearing specialist um, because he had terrible hearing problems. And she then asked whether we would agree to be seen by a geneticist, a friend of hers who was studying genetics, um, just for research purposes. And we went to see them, Howard, Matthew and Richard, went to see her. And she did lots of research into the background and the family and wrote to us and said, I think your boys all have Crouzon syndrome. Um, there's a 50-50 chance of it being passed on. This would account for all their hearing problems and, and their breathing problems, which Howard had suffered from as a young boy as well. And that was the end of the story. Um, I was not prepared to leave it and I researched who was dealing with this particular syndrome and it took me to Great Ormond Street. Uh, we first attended in, on the 29th of October 1986 um, and as David said it's all multidisciplinary and over the next few months we saw a psychologist we saw hearing specialists, we saw a geneticist, we saw a maxillofacial, we saw dental, and we came together with a final, for a final diagnosis um, in the January of the next year. Um, they were diagnosed with Cruzons. Um, one of them, and I'm, this, I'm very unmedical, so one of them had a fusion across, the other one had a fusion that way. Fortunately, they were symmetrical. Um, the diagnosis for Matthew was purely cosmetic, except that for the last four years he had been waking up in the middle of the night, sobbing his heart out, saying he hated the way he looked. He had a very severe reverse bite um, and the middle, middle, face, middle face didn't grow properly. Um, just terribly unhappy about how he looked. 
The diagnosis for Richard was that there was already indications that there was pressure on the brain, pressure on the eyes, um, and surgery was recommended, but it was very much left to us as parents of whether we went ahead with surgery. The diagnosis with Richard was much easier for us as parents because we said, what happens if we don't go ahead with surgery? And they said, well, almost certainly he will go blind and almost certainly he will be mentally affected. Matthew was much more difficult because that was really cosmetic. Um, although he had difficulty breathing and difficulty eating. And they said to us, um, if you decide to go ahead with surgery now, and we would recommend it, he will probably need to have it done when he's 15 or 16. And that's very important. Um, they went ahead with surgery together. Uh, Richard came into hospital on the 13th of April, 1987. And three days later, Matthew came in and had his surgery. Richard's surgery was just dramatic. I have a photograph album, which you're all very welcome to look at afterwards, which shows what they looked like as very, very young children. Richard had absolutely no forehead at all and had that elongated look that David mentioned in his, um, in his address. Um, and after surgery, all of a sudden he had a, he had a, a forehead and looked totally different. Um, Matthew, they did a mid-face advance, and those were the days when they didn't put a frame on, they peeled the face down, worked behind the face, took ribs out, put bits of face in, sectioned the face and brought it forward. Um, because they are such different children, Matthew very serious, um, very reserved, a great warrior, or at least he was at that time, um, and Richard, who bounced through life as though nothing mattered, their recovery was very different. Um, Richard just bounced back. He was very happy about how he looked. He went back to school 14 days after surgery. Um, Matthew took much longer. And over the next 27 years, um, they've had numerous operations, operations to correct things that were damaged during the original surgery, things that didn't quite work. Matthew's first operation was a mid-face advance, Richard's was a head reconstruction. But over the years, it was shown that Richard needed a mid-face advance as well. Um, that was done at Great Ormond Street and it was the last operation he had at Great Ormond Street. They managed to find an extension to the bed. Um, he was then 22 when he had that done. Um, after that the beds just weren't long enough and he was referred to another hospital. Um, and Matthew had fewer operations. When Matthew got to 14 or 15, they offered to do more surgery to him. And the surgery, which was another mid-face advance, avoid, um, involved a lot of preparation in the dental department. Um, and he, in fact, decided in the end that he was extremely comfortable in his own skin. Um, you can probably see part of Matthew's tattoo on the shoulder. It, he has a half-body tattoo. So when I say he's very comfortable in his own skin, I wish it was a little less co colourful. But he was very happy about how he looked, and you can still see that he's got um, a reverse bite. Um, actually, that decision not to have surgery there has come back to haunt us, because in the last year... He has been diagnosed with a very serious case of sleep apnea, which they have decided is due to the, um, to the cruisons. And had they operated when he was 15, almost certainly uh, he wouldn't need anything done about it now. Um, he has a CPAP machine, which when you're single and 33, really doesn't do your street cred any good. Um, doesn't do girlfriends uh, any favours and uh, he's single uh, and he is at the moment, he emigrated to Australia um, last October and they're hoping to do the operation there except that we think he's coming back and hopefully Ian will then see him and we'll see what happens. Um, Richard, although his surgery was so um, successful and that's Richard, isn't he a good looking boy? 
except he doesn't think he's a very good looking boy and he has had huge huge problems psychologically dealing with how he looks and uh, how you look is all about perception it's how you see himself himself yourself um, he's tried to commit suicide twice um, which was traumatic for all the family um, both Howard and I found it terribly difficult to deal with the condition. Howard particularly, uh, because it came from him, he felt very much to blame. He felt he'd passed on an enormous inheritance, a burden to his children. And that was really difficult. And there were many times when Richard particularly said that he wished that he had never lived um, and still has lots of problems. I think he's improving. Um, something major happened in 2001 which has affected the boy's future and that was that they identified the gene that caused cruzons and until that time they hadn't identified the gene and there's often a feeling as parents have you inflicted all this surgery on your children because they just happen to look like their parents or is there a real, real medical condition um, and the boys had always made a decision that they were never going to have children of their own because they didn't want them to go through all the surgery that they had had. Um, having identified the gene and being told that they would be able to ensure that if they had genetic counselling when they wanted to have families, they can eliminate that gene um, and sure has made the difference between them deciding that they will have a family. Um, there is an interesting... Um, connection between the Habsburgs, which is an Australian royal family with um, similar conditions, that Howard's family came from Sweden. His, gra his grandmother was um, in, lived in the palace of the King of Sweden um, and worked in, so his great-grandmother in the palace. And there is a rumour that one of her five sons was actually fathered by the King of Sweden because he was treated very differently. He was the only child that went to private school. He had the best of everything. Um, and there is a connection between the Swedish royal family and the Habsburgs. And it was through this particular son, through the, the, the son and Howard's mother and Howard and our sons, that the medical condition came through. Never been proved, but it's a possibility. Um, I just thought you might like to see, if I can find it, that, um, where's the, sorry, if you can find the video. Um, in 2007, uh, Princess, well, Princess Diana and um, Prince Charles uh, started the Wishing Well Appeal at Great Ormond Street. And our sons were invited back um, to meet the prince and, prince, uh, prince and princess and in 2010, 10 years after her death, they filmed our boys for a programme. I thought you might like to see it. To have some fairly major surgery and it was at that time that they launched the Wishing Well Appeal to raise funds to rebuild Great Ormond Street. Matthew and Richard, who I think were both considered both characters in the hospital, were invited back to meet Princess Diana. I remember uh, all the photographers had to stand behind the red line, um, so it was all very exciting for us, not exactly knowing what was going on, why and everything, but we knew that um, you know, the special lady, Princess Diana, was coming to the hospital, seeing us, and uh, we had to be on our, our best behaviour, or, or we had to try to be. <laughs> I, I remember Matthew saying, I'm glad she's coming, because I've got pretty ladies. I oh, fancy the pants, I thought she was gorgeous. Um, and yeah, at that, uh, that age, um, <laughs> Definitely, you know about the royal family, you know about royalty, and it's... it's she was very special. Yeah. Yes. And we were sitting there in chairs, mum and dad behind us, and just watching it, and slowly getting a little bit more anxious, and all of us becoming a bit more excited, he's near me, he's near me. And then they came down, and all of a sudden you just go over and you don't look at anything, and you're a bit scared, and she sat down on the bed, didn't she? Yeah, and she read this photograph album that I have produced from beginning to end, and as she was reading it, somebody who was escorting her around said, uh, excuse me, ma'am, but I think we need to be moving. And she turned around and said, 
I want to read this, don't worry, we'll get round and see everybody. She looked at the album and he got to the end, Angel said, would you do us the honour of signing it? And she said, yes, but I'm not supposed to. So she said, crowd round me. So we sort of all crowded round her, so that the press and the TV cameras couldn't see what's going on. And she signed it there and said, yeah, well, she the operation, the great all mystery, and us being there, having all our surgery done and operations and what we went through, the trauma, was forgotten. It was about Diana, and she came in, and then all, all, the, all the problems that we had and that we'd been thinking of or what we'd been through just were forgotten. I still remember it clear as day. I remember the feelings I had before and after enduring with her, the interview I had after. It's still clear. It's one of those... It's like it's one of those early moments of your memories that you will keep forever. So there are three million people over the world that know that Matthew fancied the pants off Princess Diana. <laughs> and when, when they actually filmed that bit and Howard was laughing, um, by the way, his voice was like that because he didn't live very much longer after that. He had cancer. Um, he said, oh, that bit's going to be cut. And apparently the story is when they took it back to, to edit it all, it was an hour's filming, everybody thought that bit was so brilliant that they kept it in. So that's the story of my boys. Okay, thank you very much, George. <laughs> now, um, would you mind coming up and sitting down and uh, answering some questions? Jill? Um, we, uh, we normally finish at 8, except when I'm speaking, uh, when it goes a bit longer. Um, uh, so, uh, Corbin will <coughs> stare oh, at me, but it's, uh, you'll well, sort it out. Yeah. You'll sort it out, okay. Fine. Mm -hmm. So, fire away with questions. You've got a great geneticist here, uh, who's actually a paediatrician. You've got a great surgeon, and you've got Jill, who's told you a wonderful story um, of with sadness and, and all sorts of other things thrown in. I don't, think, I don't think the story is finished. No. <laughs> Fine. Questions? Are you all? Oh, right. Thank you, Melis. You know when you had the, um, the DIY B&Q contraption that you made yourself? And then later you said you referred to the commercial, commercially available uh, ones. Did you find there was a great deal of difference other than the, the legislation around them? Or? Um, well, it certainly, it wasn't CE mark, what we used. Um, the, the newer devices work just as well. Ah, but did the B&Q work well? Oh, it worked perfectly. Better. Perfectly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It was a bit I cheaper as well. I remember, exactly, exactly. I remember um, as a senior house officer, a extremely qualified dental senior house officer, that I uh, that my consultant was away and uh, I wanted to put a plate on a, a great big plate or something that I would, I would drill through the bone and they didn't have the right drill for that I wanted a wood screw so I went to the local hardware store to buy a wood screw which cost about uh, in today's money is probably ten pence and uh, put it in the sterilizer which you could do then and then use it it was terrific so you know um, so the point is that, that uh, we we had uh, inventions then that we did ourselves and uh, it was far less expensive questions no you this is amazing you've you've struck them dumb <laughs> you've struck them dumb i think it was jill you've struck you've you've struck them dumb um, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, that's okay. Um, do you want to ask any questions of Jill or, you know, or, or, or talk, talk amongst yourselves? So, do you want to ask any questions of them, Jill? No, I mean, so much of what you said brought back incredible memories. Good memories or bad memories? Oh, just memories. You know, and listen, <coughs> I wish we'd never had to go through it. It's not something any parent wants to inflict on their children. Um, I, I need to see the end of the story. Yeah. So, Howard, um, sorry, yes. How are your other three children affected? Um, well, they had different fathers, 
So they were not affected at all by it. No, how were they affected emotionally? Emotionally, um, I think they probably resented a bit that our lives were taken over by medical things, operations. I mean, we spent, um, we spent about 15 years going backwards to Great Ormond Street uh, on a weekly basis, and it really took over our life. Um, they are all in an incredibly close family, uh, and they all think of themselves as brothers and sisters, not stepbrothers and sisters, which they are. Um, and they've come out of it all right. The three oldest ones are remarkably well-adjusted, mature adults. But I think it did affect them at the time. Um, I think. Yes, go ahead. Hi, sorry, can I just ask, uh, does knowing the genetic problem behind and underlying the, 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 the uh, problem, does it help in, in managing the patient surgically? That's uh, fairly, you know, to have a geneticist, a clinical geneticist in a department is very useful. And it, but it doesn't happen. Babies from family to family, I, I just saw a a couple in my clinic yesterday whose child had just been diagnosed with a, a genetic condition and they said in many ways they wished that they didn't have a label as they talk about it. But other uh, families will say it helps them get extra services if there's a specific diagnosis, particularly with children with learning disability. If it's got a name for their learning disability like Down syndrome and suddenly everybody's around helping with education and such like, but if they've just got a learning disability, they don't get the same treatment. So it varies from family to family. And some people wish that they'd rather not known before they had children, because like uh, Jill was saying, that they feel that they would have chosen not to have children if they'd known that one of them had had a genetic disorder that they could pass on. But in a way, they were pleased that they didn't know because they had gone ahead and had their children. Thank you. I don't know if you're also asking it from a surgical perspective. It's from a, just a clinical point, a personal clinical point of view. I don't think, I think you know, from other would ever have a, um, a clinical genesis. From a surgical point of view, the, the children I showed you that the condition called velocardiofacial syndrome, their carotid arteries tend to be more medial. So the surgeons quite often like to know that that's what a child's got before they start going in with their scalpels. That's useful but also having an idea of being able to try and explain to families prognosis is, is very important if you can and so having a diagnosis from that perspective is, is helpful as well. So I was asked not that much wrong. I make a guess and I'm wrong. Most of the time. And then Margot tells me the the, the or I'll say, I don't know, but it looks genetic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, I could have told you. <laughs> well, the, they usually know the ones that are for me because the case notes come in like uh, this because they've been round every department in the hospital. <laughs> I think one of the things that having Jill here that always reminds me, and it, it's in many respects humbling, is the, the effect that all of these things have, or the, these types of problems have, on the whole family. It's very easy for us as clinicians, we come in, we do our job, we, we love our job, and we go home, and sometimes we don't quite remember how, what effect all of our things, all of our interventions have on the wider family. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, I like to think I do in my day-to-day -day working life, but I probably don't enough, and I think it's important to try and remember. So if there's one thing that you remember from tonight, that should be what you remember, because that's applicable to everything that you're doing. And the, the same couple that I was speaking about that I saw yesterday um, ended up by saying to me, you were the first person that said anything positive to us in years, that you know, every time they'd been at a clinic, it was more bad news, something else had been found, and I think you've always got to give to families that bit of hope. You know, we've got to tell the truth, but if there is anything positive to say, we've got to say it. Um, Jill, you didn't mention about Howard. Howard made his living. How did Howard make his living? Howard 
was an actor. <laughs> um, a character actor, would you be surprised to know? Um, and in fact, his claim to fame was that he was in the middle of filming Doctor Who, series four, with Catherine Tate and David Tennant when he died. And if any of you have watched it and know that Bernard Cribbins played a major part playing Donna, Donna's grandfather, that was actually Howard's part. He started filming it and died in the middle of filming it, so they had to recast it, and they recast Bernard Cribbins as the grandfather um, and reshot it all. But the BBC, bless them, when they issued a, um, a DVD, uh, they included on the DVD all Howard's filming. So five and a half years after his death, I still get royalties. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, that, that's very interesting what you said about uh, uh, families and going home. And of course, it applies in, as you said, it applies all the time because we, um, uh, I think I've said this to you before, um, patients want to protect us. They, they love their surgeons and they, um, and uh, I know that uh, you've downplayed your role, David, but what do you feel about the surgeons? What was the name of the consultant surgeon, Jill, who, uh, who I worked for? David James. David James. Do you remember what he looked like? Is he oh, still absolute, there? Absolutely. You, would you recognise him in the street now? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So I wouldn't recognise my mother, but I'd recognise <laughs> him. <laughs> yeah. yes. so and, the point, and Barry Jones. And Barry Jones, yes. yes. Okay. So the point is that the, um, that the surgeons play a pivotal role, um, and patients want to protect us, don't they, Jill? We, yes. they don't, you, you don't want to tell us the bad stories that go on uh, afterwards. You want to, when you come to the clinic, you want to make us feel good about ourselves. Is that, would you say that's fair? Um, I think we had, I've had a lot to do with the NHS. I think, I don't know whether it was Great Ormond Street that was such a hospital of excellence, but they treated us incredibly well. Um, I think one of the biggest difficulties was they explained exactly what was going to happen in, in the operation, the first, the first operations, um, and we tried as much as we could to explain to the children what was happening. But you can't. There is nothing that you can say to a child that prepares them for going into hospital feeling well and healthy and waking up feeling in pain. And Matthew used to say, I don't feel good. And it said it all. And that, and that as parents is just so painful. Have you, interestingly, have they ever been... Um, uh, wanted to know about the exact details of how their operation was done? Have they ever wanted to watch a video of their, their operation? Yes, um, um, and they know exactly what it was done. And I think this album, which you're all welcome to look at, which actually shows what they were like as very young children and shows Ian 25, 27 years ago. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that photograph album has helped them more than anything else because it's a memory. Of what, of what they went through and what they've achieved and they have their personal achievement is amazing. But David, do you have patients who keep photograph albums like that? That's what we call it. I think I think patients do, I think they I think they do. I I've asked them for there have been a few patients that have been subject of television documentaries that yeah. You know, keep the recordings. They watch them again. I, in, I, in fact, that album, I made two. I made a second copy, which I gave to Great Ormond Street. And at one time, they told me how helpful it had been. Do you mind if I pass it around? No, please do. Into, why don't you all huddle together so you can look over each other's shoulders so you can be very quick? Okay? One, two. So, I would flick through for speed. Uh, without damaging um, so they keep DVDs and they uh, and they keep um, um, they photos. photos yes 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 and they keep in touch as well yeah 
what did you feel about their changed appearance? Because some of the parents find um, that very strange. When Richard had his mid-face advance when he was 22, that was traumatic and uh, earth-shattering because he used to look in the mirror and say, the person that's looking back at me is not me. And it, the change was dramatic and people didn't recognize him. It was such a change. The first operations, I don't know, perhaps because there was so much trauma involved in the actual operation and swelling and bruising, um, it, and it didn't seem as dramatic, although it was, but that operation that he had when he was 22 was life-changing. Um, David, do you want to um, uh, explain to the audience why he had to have the same operation done twice? Yeah. Uh, uh, the mid, if you have mid-phase surgery before growth is completed, usually the, the growth is restricted in any event, but it won't continue to grow, and so you would correct, correct it at the time, and then the, the lower part of the face, the j lower jaw, would continue to grow, and therefore the mid-phase would remain where it was and remain disproportionately small, so you would then anticipate doing it later on. And that leads to one of the dilemmas for patients with this type of problem. Do you do something at the age of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, or do you wait till growth is complete? And that's a discussion that we have regularly with families, and often it's a slow decision that's made over several years, depending on how the child is developing, whether they're being teased at school, having problems at school, having obstructive sleep apnea, so if there are symptoms or psycho psychological problems, and sometimes it's a matter of how the child reacts to those psychological pressures. Some kids, it's not a problem at all, and they manage and they get on with it, and they're not concerned, and others are troubled by it greatly. And it doesn't seem to be easy to predict which patients will cope with it and who won't. I think it helped that Matthew and Richard were operated on at the same time. Mm. They supported it. It was very unusual, yes. which is why they invited us back to meet Diana. Um, but I think they supported each other enormously. Um, I, uh, I wanted to... So it's essentially damage to the growth centres. So. The, the face stops growing, the mid-face stops growing once the surgery is done. Do you, do you think that uh, distraction does less damage to the growth centres? Well, I, I'm not sure that the surgery damages the growth centres. Okay. But I suspect that the potential for growth is minimal, and that's why they have <coughs> retrusive mid-faces. You try and overcorrect them, but you can probably not overcorrect them enough, depending on, sometimes you can, but mostly you can't. So I, So you think it's not damage to the growth centers, you think, I it's, think a, it's, it's the, just the, the, the condition, natural condition? The condition restricts the growth in any event, mm -hmm. so say they're going to have 10% growth in comparison to the, to the normal, I think that remains after the surgery, so one would have to overcorrect it, and if you're doing that between at the age of eight, for example, that's a huge overcorrection, and they would look slightly equine <laughs> from the age of eight till twelve. They might look okay from the age of twelve till fifteen, and then it would they would still have if a retrusive you, maxilla. If you remember, because you were the one that wired his jaws together first thing they did with Matthew was put on these wonderful gold splints over his teeth, which they were then going to use to wire his jaws together so that it didn't go back, and they fell off. And so, although you wired the jaws together, and there are pictures in there of you doing that, yeah. it didn't last. So the overcorrection that you talked about that they'd hoped to do was not very successful. 
I probably got told off for that because I was the I don't think senior your, registrar. No, it wasn't your fault that they fell off. I'm sure it, it was, was because <laughs> it, 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 I'm sure it was because <laughs> we had to use we had to use um, horrible cement, copper-based cement, black cement, black cement. Copper cement. and the, you never knew whether it was sticking on. It, it went off very quickly, and uh, you, you didn't know whether the whether the thing sat down properly on the teeth because you couldn't see the teeth. It was just a disaster. I hated it. Yeah. Two two things we don't use cast cap splints anymore and it's always the registrar's fault <laughs> irrespective of what it was yes. <laughs> but I did get to do one side of the surgery I think from memory I can't uh, I can't remember exactly um, but I think uh, and I don't know which I think I only operated on one of them yes it was your Matthew Matthew yes, yes. Okay, Barry and Richard yeah um, so, uh, so yes, I remember. I didn't mention any specific genes, but the one involved in Cruz syndrome is a fibroblast growth factor receptor, so that explains why the bone doesn't grow normally. Uh huh. Okay. So now you need to ask about the fibroblast growth receptor and its its role in growth. Come on, questions. Nobody wants to know. It's important for growth. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, there speaks a geneticist. All right. Any uh, any other questions? All right. Well, I think uh, from my point of view, it's been a fascinating evening. It started off very well with uh, you, David, as always. Uh, very low key um, and very humble, and presenting some fascinating cases. It was then. Fascinating with you, Margot, and uh, looking at uh, how genetics is advanced and uh, seeing the, the latest kid on the block right at the end, so that was great. And, and then culminating with you, Jill, and I, I, I always love the patient stories best of all. Despite, despite the excellence of the questions, I think, uh, I, you know, for me, it comes alive, and we can keep you, keep you here for another two hours to answer questions that I said before. Um, and give them a chance, they probably would too. Um, so thank you ever such a lot. Um, David's come down from Glasgow, Margot's come down from Glasgow, especially to talk to you. So they deserve extra special thanks for, for that. And Jill has come from Dorking. Dorking, yes. And is there snow in Dorking? It wasn't when I left. I don't know what I'm going to go back to. Okay. <laughs> well, don't fall over again, please. Uh, I'm okay. All right. So thank you very much.